Welcome back to the channel. We have another Q&A from Friday, October 30th today, and uh, we talked about the high register. We talked about a bunch of exciting things coming up uh, in my virtual studio. We talked about the UNT Jazz Trombone Day, uh, as well as questions about transcription and uh, a little bit more. So we talked a lot, of, really a bulk of this conversation was centered around uh, a little bit of a rant of me talking about the best tunes or the worst tunes to uh, start off with when you're trying to learn to improvise. So I hope you'll check out the description below where there's the time codes and you can jump to the questions that really interest you the most. But thanks for being here. Make sure you click that little bell next to the subscribe button so that uh, you can see all the videos that are coming out here on the channel. So thanks. I'm glad uh, to share with you today. So have a great one and uh, we'll see you in the next video. This is a quick question. What lapel mic is that? Uh, this microphone is uh, from Amazon. It was very, very cheap, and it's just going uh, into Instagram, actually. This mic here, this Rode mic, is what's going into Facebook. Not trombone related, that's fine, but maybe you can share your thoughts on combining daily job and moving forward in music career and practicing. Is it a healthy situation? What do you think? Yeah, I think the most important thing that you have to do, Ricardo, I see your question also. Uh, that, that's a really difficult question, and I think it comes down really to the question of, you know, keeping balance in your life and keeping balance in your goals and uh, of what's realistic for you uh, as a musician, as a person, and what what you feel like you need to focus on at any given time. So, you know, I think that it's important to look at the long run. You know, you have your be you have your ideas of what you want to do in your whole life as a musician, not just today. But sometimes the idea of going away from music to kind of come back to or to kind of combine different interests to then loop back and integrate into your career or to, to sustain you while you're building your musical career sometimes gets stigmatized a little bit and I think that you have to do what you have to do what you have to do and you have to find balance you know um, there's a lot of things that are a trade-off when you are a musician you know you can say I'm only going to do musical work when that's going to limit your work to you know other people deciding that they can hire you or if you decide to integrate teaching then you got to find students and then you have to kind of make yourself flexible to their needs and their schedule so no matter whether you say like oh like i'm going to work within the music industry and do other stuff in addition to your playing or you work outside of the music industry and do other stuff in addition to your playing it really is just a balance of like what makes sense for you you know wh whether you have other interests whether you can find any um, flow, any creativity in doing other stuff. You know, I find a good mix of that is good, important for me. That's why I have a record label and do the media company and do YouTube and do music marketing and do Instagram, Facebook Live and do practicing and writing music and playing concerts and touring when I can and playing with other people and leading my own bands because um, I think like I get bored pretty easily and it's always been a, a thing in my life that I got, I've gotten bored pretty quickly. So even when I was in school as a kid, always bored with this and that. So kind of moving and having different things that I can work on and keep, to keep my mind engaged by having a wide variety of um, stuff. So, um, but yeah, so Alex, I hope that helps. I, um, you know, I think you got to do what you got to do. I mean, I worked all different kinds of jobs in college. I worked at a pizzeria when I was in high school. I worked at a sandwich shop. I did telemarketing for a very short time. Um, and then kind of once I got in after my second year of college, I was just decided to do more teaching, music teaching, and then, um, those other things. But, um, I've always been teaching, uh, that whole time and Bill slowly, slowly, slowly building up a studio and now a college professor job. So it's just one, one step at a time. It's the best standard to start practicing improvisation, the best standard. Um, I don't think there is a best standard. There are some common ones. And uh, since there's not a huge influx of questions, I'm just going to go off here on a little tangent and talk about a few different tunes that are commonly used and some tunes that I think could be better ones to use than the ones that are commonly used. So first off is that everyone always starts with the blues usually. And there's nothing wrong with the blues. Obviously, we all like to play the blues. I love playing the blues. Um, but I don't think it's the best place to start for improvisational study or practice because it's the blues is actually mostly an exception to all the rules of harmony. Um, the whole thing is dominant chords. 
um, especially a simple blues, it's all dominant chords. Um, and so it's the exception to the rule, right? And so what I like to start with is more like simple tunes that go from one to five and back to one, like um, down by the riverside or something like that. If then you wanna incorporate a four chord, that would be something like when the saints go marching in, that could be uh, somewhere to start with. Um, really focusing on like learning the basics of harmony at the same time. Uh, I mean, obviously there's nothing wrong with learning a blues first or do it. And then I go to also what Trevor mentioned here. He says, I like modal tunes, like, so what? And so, so what is a great place to start? The only problem is the bridge goes to E flat minor, which means most beginning improvisers do not have that kind of G flat major under their slide super well or under other, you know, whatever instrument they're playing. It's not, it's common key. So it becomes difficult uh, on that one. So actually with my nonprofit Institute for Creative Music, we started using, um, there's a Radiohead tune called Packed Like Sardines in a, in a Packed Like Sardines in a Crushed Tin Box. Uh, that's the full name. And we would use that one because that's an eight bar loop and has a nice melodic bass line. And it, it's the same kind of sound as So What, but it gives students uh, a chance to explore improvisation. We like to play improvisation games that have nothing to do with tonal harmony. They just have to do with rhythm and sound to get um, students improvising, but not having to worry so much about to navigating tonal harmony, because that's you know another level of limitation that uh, prevents people from getting started, I think. Um, but to get to the other question, you know, there's other tunes that people go to first, like All the Things You Are. I don't think that's a good place to start because All the Things You Are goes through so many keys so fast that you're just navigating catch up. You're playing catch up all the time and you're never uh, really digging in because it's too much, too many keys all at the same time. On the, on the other hand, you can say, well, you're practicing a lot of different keys. So it means that you'll get a lot of experience really quickly with a lot of different keys. So. I, I can see it both ways, but I don't necessarily think it's the best place to start. And then other people start with autumn leaves and there's nothing wrong with autumn leaves, but again, you're navigating a lot of different harmonic devices all at the same time. So I like to go with something simpler, um, not necessarily simpler, but just different. Like um, I, I like, like take the A train for example, because it's A-A-B-A, -A -A, which so many tunes are A-A-B-A. Um, there's not two beats, two uh, chords in each bar. There's long sounds. Uh, it deals with all of the major um, like tonal harmony areas that you're going to want to start with, except for minor. So it's just major, right? And it, so it goes, you know, one to two dominant. And that two dominant is really important. It's a really helpful sound to get familiar with. And then two, five, one. And then the bridge is two, five to four. And it goes back to that two dominant or six. So, um, so then it goes down to D, D7, which is uh, that, yeah, the six of F. Sorry, I'm just rambling here. The six of F, but the two of um, uh, the two of uh, C. Anyway, regardless of that. So I go to something like that, that uh, navigate tonal harmony and not just um, the blues. And anyway, so that's kind of my approach to starting off. So something like So What, something like Sardines, something like Take the A Train. And then you want to get into something in terms of like bebop land. I like to go to something like Afternoon in Paris, that John Lewis tune, because um, it's te teaching sequences. It's just two fives. And then it's a pedal point on the bridge, three, one, six, two, five, three, six, two, five. And a little bit of chromatic motion, but you can kind of take it out if you want to. Um, so really just for me, it's like, what are you going to get the most bang for your buck with studying? And But that's also not too overwhelming. There's a fine line, I think between overwhelming and uh, overwhelming and uh, and really helpful. So that's those are a couple of places I would start. So sorry, that was a really long answer, Ricardo. Hopefully that, that helped you. When would somebody be ready to teach privately? Um, I think you're ready to teach privately pretty much from the time you're in high school. Um, I, that's when I started teaching privately was when I was in high school. Because uh, there's always going to be someone, you know, I talk to this with my college students all the time. There's always someone that's one level, or not level, but step maybe, behind you in development, right? So there's always going to be, if you're in college, there's going to be some college, some high school kids that need help with the fundamentals, right? And that you have more experience with than they do. If you're in high school, there are elementary school students that need to learn how to make that first sound. And 
through the process of teaching, it really helps you to understand what you're doing. You know, at least I think it helps you on when you explain something, when you have to explain something to somebody else, it helps you understand it kind of on a different level. Um, when you have to like, okay, they're not getting it. How else can I explain this? How else can we connect about how do I physically move my slide from first to sixth, you know, to play, you know, one, two, three. And how do I, how did I learn how to do that? How did I make a sound? Do I need to buzz? Am I actually buzzing when I play? Am I, do I need to do, how do I get do that siren buzz thing? You know, and just like, okay, how do I get this student to open up their sound? And then you're like, am I even doing that? Like, how do I open up my sound? So it kind of, to me, like the more you teach, the more it helps you to help yourself. And there's always somebody that has um, less experience than you. Like, even if you've been playing trombone for three days and they've been tr playing trombone for one, you know, there's something you can show them um, that would be helpful. You know, in the beginning, you know, I taught lessons for free or really cheap. Um, just to get experience, you know, and to figure out like, can I do this? Do I feel comfortable doing this? Do I have things to share? Like all of those doubts that kind of come into our mind about teaching or sharing, you know, am I still these students going to get anything out of this? You know, am I going to screw them up? Anything like that. So just kind of get, try to get that out of your mind. At least that helps me get that out of my mind and then focus on just sharing, you know, just sharing the knowledge that you do have and um, sending them to somebody else when the time is right, you know? If you feel like, man, this person has really like surpassed my level of expertise, then you send them on to the next, the next person, to the next uh, teacher that can help them. So, um, you know, I, I view your one's job as an educator as, you know, t telling them, showing them things they haven't thought about yet, you know, um, and holding them accountable on a week to week basis. That's basically it. The, all the whole practicing thing, getting better is on the person. It's on the student to take that on themselves. I can't do the practicing for you. <laughs> so, you know, I can't be self critiquing in the week or two weeks between the times I see you, you know, you've got to take it into your own hands. And if you don't, that's fine, but uh, you're not going to progress. You know, I can't practice for you. So, that's that's kind of what I think about teaching. Okay, tips for expanding the high range. This is from James the Wall. Um, so yeah, sure. The, I've got a couple of videos on YouTube about this if you want to go deeper into it. But my main tips are play in the high range. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if you play melodies in the upper register, it will start to naturally develop your high range by forcing you to play in that register. And so I think that doing exercises is not super useful for having a useful high register. Um, you just get really used to playing high notes in a certain exercise, right? Whether it's like a lip slur or something like that. So I like to take ballad melodies. A great one to start with is Getting Sentimental. Tommy Dorsey played that one. Uh, it's, it starts in D. It starts on the C sharp. It goes up to a high C sharp. If that's too high, transpose it down to like F f major and start on e in the staff and then just go up chromatically just the opening phrase play melodies in the upper register and then uh, that's kind of the general approach but in terms of the like tactical details of like how to get the high register to speak i like to focus on airspeed and focus um, i don't think that Focusing on the musculature is helpful. Uh, it wasn't for me. I did for many years try different things about like strengthening the corners and all this kind of thing, but um, I never found it to be super, super helpful for me. So I decided to uh, focus on airspeed and focus and speed, and that's always been super helpful. So uh, I like to focus on making, making the air kind of narrower and feel like it's like uh, a laser beam or going through a straw, different size straws to get the notes out. And then really what it is is changing the vowel shape inside of your mouth to go from O to A ah to E as you go into the upper register. So oh, oh. so when you say E, the tongue, if you notice, the back of the tongue goes up, E, right? So I, um, I, like so once it goes up, then it, fo it focuses the air into a tighter stream because there's less space in the mouth. So um, those are some general tips. Um, there's a lot of people with a lot of different approaches. I see Trevor says, Andy Martin taught me to gliss. 
up to the high register for sure. Yep, helps train airspeed and consistent embouchure. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of different exercises. You know, you can you can go like gliss up like F to B flat, and then you move the B flat out to fifth position. This is high B flat, and then you can gliss up to D, then move the D to fourth and gliss up to F, or you could just like put the high C out in sixth and try to gliss up to F. Um, there's a lot of those type exercises. There's doing an octave kind of rips uh, from B flat and then go out because the further you go out, the less resistance there is. Uh, and Or more resistance there is? I guess it's less, but the easier it is to access some of those upper partials. So you can go boo, 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 and you can play mostly all those notes out in seventh, but um, you can figure out exactly which position you might want to try them in. So like D, C, three to three, D flat would be five to two to five, four, and then D would be um, one to four, boo, and then E flat, you can go third to seventh, uh, some people will argue with me about that, but you can. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of exercises like that. But be patient. Don't hurt yourself. Uh, be kind to yourself. The, the, the kind of trick for me was stopping caring about playing high. That was the unlock for being able to play in the upper register for me. It was when I stopped practicing all the exercises people had shown me to play in the upper register, uh, it finally started to come together. So for whatever that's worth, um, not being obsessed with it, um, being obsessed, more obsessed with developing as a musician. The high register is only the, just a tool. It's not really that important. There's plenty of people that don't play above a high C or a high D and have amazing careers and are amazing musicians. So the high range is not that super important, but lots of people like to pretend that it is because it's like a, it's a stand-in for progress, musical progress. That's what I think. <laughs> Any other shapes that help improvisation besides like one, two, three, five? from Jonah. Uh, yes, there's lots of shapes. I don't even know if I could really, um, I don't know if I could really list them all. One, two, three, five. There's one, two, flat, three, five. There's one, flat, two, three, five. There's triads of all types. Those are shapes. There's um, major, minor, augmented, diminished triads. You got to know all of those. There's one, two, there's one, four, five. There's one, two, five. There's one, three, five, seven. Like a major seven, a minor seven, a half diminished seven. They're all shapes and they can all be stacked on top of other bass notes and they can all become something else. For example, if you put an F major seven over a D flat, you end up with D flat major seven sharp nine. So, D flat major seven, sharp five, sharp nine. Is that what I said? Maybe not. But so it's really important to get all of those basic shapes. One, two, three, five is only one. And then one, two, three, five, six, one, which is pentatonic. You can go one, uh, and then you can add in the flat six, one, two, three, five, six, flat six. So yeah, um, you're opening a Pandora's box here, Jonah, that I don't think uh, you'll be able to um, close which is good, it's a good thing, but so one, two, three, five, one, two, three, five minor, all four kinds of triads, all the types of sevenths chords, that's where you should start. Tips for transcription, Kevin asks. Um, yeah, sure, there's so many tips for transcription, um, but the most important tip for transcription is, um, this is how I like to do it, which is to learn it. Don't write it down right away. Transcribe it to your brain <laughs> first. Uh, so that means, I mean, half the battle with the transcriptions is knowing what comes next, right? So it's really not a matter of trombone playing. It's totally a matter of um, mem remembering how it goes. So I always recommend my students listen to just the solo on repeat. So put the track into GarageBand, cut it out, export that file, put it on your phone, and just listen to that excerpt on repeat. Not until you can just sing it along, but until you know what comes next without having to think about it, because that's what's going to allow you to most quickly transcribe. So listen to it till you can't not remember it. Sing along to it until uh, you can sing it accurately. Oh, you know, close. <laughs> Singing for some of us is harder than others. Some of us will take more time to develop our voices. Uh, and then the third thing is then start to play it. Get the what, meaning the notes. From there, you get to the how. So what the notes are, how are the notes being played? 
And then the last thing is like, how do you get all the isms of that player? So if you're transcribing Carl Fontana, he has different isms than JJ Johnson, which is different than Curtis, which is different than commercial jokes, which is different uh, than Slide Hampton, different than Michael Deese. Um, so there you go. Uh, so do the, all that and then write it down at the end, after you've memorized it, after you can play it, after you've studied the how, after you've stored all of that, uh, then that's how, that's my transcription process. I write it down at the very end uh, so that I can remember it and maybe show it to somebody else and share it. And uh, so then I view when I get somebody else's transcription to look at and somebody else's transcription to uh, play, that's like an etude to me. There's like a transcription. It's like when I learn it by ear and then when somebody gives me the music, then that's, that's uh, like an etude, like a jazz etude. And why I don't generally focus on jazz etudes more on jazz transcriptions from somebody else, which are a stand-in for etudes. Uh, Ricardo has, as a jazz trombone player, should we just transcribe trombone solos or other instruments too? You should transcribe whatever is inspiring to you, I think. Um, there's certain things I think you should transcribe to get a context of what's possible on the instrument, a context of technique on the instrument, but I think you have to dive deep, not wide. Um, uh, I think you should di dive deep on one, two, three, four, five people in your life, you know, really get inside of the, their playing. I mean, more if you want, but like sometimes we go too wide and not deep enough. So, you know, I think it's important to study someone like J.J. Johnson, like C Curtis Fuller, like Slide Hampton. Uh, maybe you could go even older than that, check out people like Lawrence Brown, go deep into people like that. Or if you want to play early jazz, you want to go with Jack Teagarden, you want to go with Kid Ori, Miff Mull. It doesn't matter what part of the history you want to dive deep into, but identify like what you connect with. And then maybe it's modern players. Maybe you want to do a deep dive into Elliot Mason or Marshall Jokes and Michael Deese. And then maybe you want to work backwards from there and see what influenced them. So. Uh, that's on trombone, but if you only limit yourself to trombone, you're going to be very kind of narrow, you know, so I've transcribed trumpet players and saxophone players and guitar players and pianists. I like some of my biggest inspiration comes from Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea, like harmonically and phrasing wise and, you know, com and compositionally, like transcribing melodies from tunes that are, you know, not, not only bebop tunes like bud powell wrote some amazing bebop tunes but then also like people like bob brookmeyer who wrote incredible music um so i mean there's a lot of options there there's a lot of things you know i don't limit yourself i've transcribed pat metheny a bunch um yeah i mean it's all different things and uh it's a you are going to be the blend of all those things you know so uh you can do it all thanks ricardo for that question that's a you know, it's an insightful question, and um, the, it's it's usually always for me like a yes and, you know, hello, son of RP. Um, a yes and meaning yes, transcribe trombonists, and transcribe non-trombonists, you know. It's all of the above. Um, hope you have an amazing weekend. Be safe out there uh, for Halloween if you're celebrating, and uh, we will catch you uh, in a week. So thanks for being here.